Let's, uh, let, let's move on then to our third um, plenary speaker, who is uh, Professor Pamela Cox, um, who is a social historian at the University of Essex. And again, I've seen her slides, so I know how well this will fit. Um, uh, what are the essential ingredients for a successful interdisciplinary research project? Thank you. I realised I didn't get mic'd up earlier, but I think, is that okay? Yeah. Are you able? Right. Is that all right? Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, I just need my glasses. Sorry. You can tell someone who's not used to wearing glasses. Someone who's not wearing glasses. Comes to us all. Okay, slightly different title, but... Hidden within that title will be the, the title in your, in your programme. Um, so I'd like to share my experiences of, of uh, leading, conducting, and more importantly, communicating interdisciplinary research. Um, and I'm going to draw on examples from my recent projects, um, historical, sociological, criminological, gender-based, that's the kind of zone I, I work in, social policy as well. Um, my, another experience though, of, of running one of the ESRC doctoral training partnerships, um, the SENS DTP, which I'll talk about in a second, which is an interdisciplinary partnership. And finally, and slightly oddly, but we're doing interdisciplinary, so it's okay to jump around, um, I'll talk about my experience of, of, of um, presenting some TV series and what that taught me in terms of communication. I mean, it was an absolute masterclass in terms of uh, communications, really. So we're going to jump around a little bit, but I hope that's all right. So I'd, I'd like to suggest that... Uh, what interdisciplinarity needs, and this will come as no surprise to anybody here, is communication, number one. You've got to be able to talk across disciplines, write across disciplines, uh, and uh, you've got to do that with clarity. You've got to compromise. Um, that's sometimes in rather short supply, I find, in, in uh, interdisciplinary work. You've got to have reflexivity, both within your own discipline, knowing its own kind of strengths and failings, and being reflexive across uh, specialisms. But uh, another one I'd add to that is respect, which I'll come back to in a second. But the point of all that, or what's the reward of doing that, is, is this last one, which is to open up new creative ground. And that in itself is a public good. And I want to try and uh, anchor my opening comments around that idea. So I've given a lot of talks on interdisciplinarity, um, and I've, I've uh, justified the use of interdisciplinarity in ways that will be familiar to you. You know, it's more effective, it's more efficient, um, you get a broader reach, you get broader impact, you get bigger research grants, you know, we know all, all of that. So that's all true. Um, it doesn't make your heart beat particularly uh, to, to, do, to do it like that. It's rather instrumental. So when I was writing my abstract for, for, for today, um, I wanted to try and open up the subject around this idea of, 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 the, of public good. And I think the comments the, uh, we, we just heard there about, about you know, how do, you, how do you, uh, researchers um, not... How do researchers avoid the idea of a vested interest and, uh, and that they're operating for somebody else, they're working for a company, they're working for a charity? I think our defence as academics, and I'm speaking as an academic in a not necessarily academic audience here, is that universities are the bastion, and universities can be that space that, that for, for, for that public um, uh, ground, perhaps. Maybe. Let's see. <laughs> um, so public good can obviously be defined in different ways. It can refer quite specifically to a commodity or service provided without profit to all members of society. It can also refer more generally to public well-being. We can also think of interdisciplinarity as common good. Now, you could have a whole seminar, couldn't you, on the differences between public good and common good, and uh, we, we won't do that now. But, you know, in political discourse, public good refer, sorry, common good refers to facilities, material, cultural, institutional, that members of a community provide to all to fulfil a relational obligation that they have to care for certain interests that they have in common. Parks, hospitals, schools, um, transport, climates, you know, any number of things we can name as, as common goods and, and, and that kind of thing. But as a philosophical concept, common good depends on um, practical reasoning. It depends on that ability to communicate, which brings me back to my opening point, that, that, that necessity of dialogue. 
So we might think of interdisciplinarity then as being enabled by a series of facilities both inside and outside the academy and those facilities contribute to an inclusive model for practical reasoning and I want to try and come back to that comment later. It's not a philosophy lecture by the way, I am going to get onto the TV stuff in a, in a bit. <laughs> okay. Um, and, but I would say in fractured times like these and none more so than this week where we face this most dramatic election that actually you know, pra practical reasoning and reasonable dialogue and respect for others' opinions is, has never been more vital. And we, we need to play our part in that as you know, experts and uh, social researchers. We need to respect the public or, uh, audience, I think, much more than possibly we do. And certainly that was the message I had from, the, from, from, from TV. Um, so... Um, in preparing for this, I, I was looking for other scholars who'd actually use the term interdisciplinarity for public good. Not many, when you do a Google search on that actual phrase. But happily for me, uh, Elizabeth Warren <laughs> has done that. So she was one of the few, actually, who, who used that actual phrase. So forgive me for a minute. I'm just going on a little detour with Elizabeth Warren and debt. So bear with me, and I'm then coming back to other things. So, as you know, Elizabeth Warren is a, is a front-runner for the Democrat uh, presidential nomination. She's also a full Harvard law professor specialising in debt. So she's, she's, she's an academic. Um, uh, she sees an urgency in many things, um, so it's not surprising she's going to see interdisciplinarity as an urgent uh, challenge for the academy. And she's, her, this, this piece she's writing is really around what the academy needs to do to up its game. Um, and it's in this book, uh, A Debtor, uh, Debtor World, Interdisciplinary Perspectives on, on Debt. And that phrase, balance of knowledge, I'll come back to in, in a second. So basically, um, her argument is that um, debt in the US in the run-up to the crash 2008 was the product of many intersecting factors, interdisciplinary factors, if you like. It was to do with financial institutions and economic institutions that extended credit and offered loans. It was to do with political and legal systems that regulated or failed to regulate uh, those, those uh, institutions. It was to do with our own personal and collective psychologies, our attitude to debt, our desire to to acquire and, 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 and aspire and achieve. So already you've got economics, politics, uh, uh, psychology, economics uh, bound into, into, that, into that mix. And she says to understand debt, you need to take an interdisciplinary view, and that's basically the point of that book. Um, but what intrigued me about her essay in the book was this phrase, the balance of knowledge. So she says basically academics have to play catch up because if we don't catch up, um, we're just already lost the game to industry. She said, you know, the Bank of America had already done way more social research than uh, perhaps in, uh, interdisciplinary social research on debt than uh, most universities. And she said, if you, if you add to that Citigroup, uh, Chase, Capital One, Discover, Wells Fargo, American Express and others, she estimates that they, you know, sent out uh, thousands of, exper of, of um, let me get this right, she, I'll quote from her, it, th th they conducted ex experiments at vast scale, they sent out millions of pieces of mail to test consumer behaviour with credit cards, you know, between them. Um, and all of that research was done in-house by those banks, usually by interdisciplinary academic teams who were working in, you know, working, uh, then working for banks. But, as she says, without foundation funding, without approval of any human subjects review committees, and without ethical review, without peer review, without the concerns over replicability of findings, without any of the elements that are the hallmark of scholarly work. Now, that may be unduly suspicious on her part, and I'm very aware of my, the audience here. You know, many of you work in you know, private social research. I'm, I'm very aware my friend Debbie Lee Chan is right in front of me, working for Witch and Ipsos Mori. And of course I would trust Debbie that she would have uh, a good ethical framework, probably at least as, you know, more better than some of the people in my department. I didn't say that. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm not, yes, I really know. It's not, it's not, yeah, fine, okay. But you know what I mean? So, the, so Warren's hitting on the private industry saying their research isn't as ethical as, as that done in universities. But she is onto something in the sense that the lenders she's talking about are interested in lending. They're not interested in the public interest. They're not interested in the public good. You know, they are interested in raising more debt. And we saw what happened when they did that. You know, this is, we are now living with the consequences and Johnson will be with us for five years because of it uh, tomorrow, probably. Um, 
So thanks for that, Bank of America. <laughs> Good. But, but, but she, she raises this important question, as Adrian Smith did this morning, about rule setting, rule setting in, in, in social research and private research, which I think is important. Um, and that leads her to talk about the public good. So that's how we get to this, this line that she, that she comes up with. She says, um, uh, she makes an argument for interdisciplinary research as a public good. Um, in the debt field, she cites the interdisciplinary work of, for example, the Centre for Responsible Lending in the US, which works on payday lending, banking fees, the mortgage crisis, the National Consumer Law Centre, works on student loan, consumer fraud, foreclosures, and Consumer Federation of America on credit card and overdraft fees. Now, so she's saying that this, this does exist. You can have that mixed economy of research for public good. Um, and I guess we do have the equivalent here in the UK, and the SRA might be considered one of those, but probably could have a higher, you know, louder voice in the current climate. You know, the IFS we have. But where are our equivalents of those institutions? How might we, what, 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 what might we do to encourage these facilities for practical reasoning around these issues? Now, Warren concludes that essay, um, uh, and, and the idea is that the balance of knowledge has shifted away from the, the academy and sort of reputable social research to private industry-based research, and the balance has shifted, and, and we're too late to get it back. It's quite a stark warning, really. Um, uh, she says, the world of debt is tilting out of control. The information asymmetry, i.e. the balance of knowledge, is, was real but modest a decade ago, is accelerating and is rapidly transforming borrowing and lending, and clearly not in the public interest in her words in her terms. Now, Warren's message um, was brought home to me quite starkly yesterday uh, by, uh, I was at an interdisciplinary event organised by, oh no, wrong one, hang on, where, where, it go? where have they gone? Hang on, we'll go back to that. Oh. Okay, this one. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd move those up, I think we moved them up and didn't save them. Um, so SENS, Southeast Network for Social Science, which is what I do for 60% of my week, I run SENS, which is uh, an ESRC DTP, Doctoral Training Partnership. Um, and we had an event yesterday, which I'll tell you about. Let me just give you the blurb. That sends 10 universities in the Southeast. If anyone wants to collaborate with us on anything, I'll be around for tea uh, afterwards. Um, and we, we cover 13 disciplines, so we give out PhD funding, but we run advanced training in all sorts of things across those disciplines and more and more on the website if you're interested. So yesterday, we held a, a conference at South Bank, fascinating, on computational social science, fairly modestly attended by social scientists, I have to say. Um, but uh, those of us that were there, they were PhD students who'd finished a course we've just run on how to tool up, how to get computational <coughs> methods training, how to, how to learn, how, how to you know, scrape Twitter, how to uh, do basic algorithmic research and so on, because we've got to start somewhere. Um, most of us, uh, even those in research council-funded DTPs, are playing catch-up. There's only a few you know, pockets of people who knew, knew uh, um, how to push this forward. Um, so, it, it, Warren's point about um, how we create institutions to do this kind of work is, is, is very pertinent, I think, and where there's some, there's some catching up to do. I mean, I, as an aside, I did spend a lot of yesterday talking to the various business partners who turned up to that event um, uh, to, uh, to try and tap them up for placements for my PhD students at SENS. So, of course, I want it both ways. I want to work with, I want to put PhD students in with, with industry. But equally, I want, that, I want to have industry a little bit at arm's length. I don't want to be directed by Bayes to say I, my job is to raise national productivity. Because that doesn't, it is important, but it, we, we need to keep our critical distance as universities if we are to be institutions for the public good. Um, and we, 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 we can't be, um, the, the, the balance has to be uh, the right way around, I think. So interdisciplinarity led by academics, public bodies, with industry partners, but not wag, you know, being wagged by that particular dog, uh, can help to ensure that interdisciplinary work opens up ground for common good, public good. So I want to, let me zip back. Apologies, let me just zip to where I was going to take you. Let me give you a couple of examples of stuff I'm doing personally. Uh, around um, interdisciplinarity, and then I'll end with the TV stuff. So how much more time do I have? I've got about... Uh... Oh, quite. 15, 15 oh, minutes. fine, fine. We'll probably slow down then. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, 
It's because I've, because of Adrian Smith this morning, I've tweaked this talk, and you know how it's kind of changed it now, so it's uh, slightly uh, slightly out of kilter, but it'll, it'll, I'm going to come on to his, his, I want to respond to that point about narrative and who controls the narrative of social research. And I also want to talk about a little, I don't know if he's, uh, to, to talk about that, that idea of sort of macro social policy, social policy at scale, and put a claim in for the importance of the micro at the same time, especially in the domains he was talking about, criminal justice, social care, safeguarding, and so on. Anyway, come back to, come back to that in a second. So I'm, I'm leading um, two projects at the moment. Um, one is, uh, uh, it's, on, uh, it's on victims. Is there? Right, so that's the, this is the uh, project. Victims, access to justice in English criminal courts, 1675 to the present. And it's funded by the ESRC and it involves these partner universities. So seven academics interdisciplinary. So my own background, I might have said, is first degree in history, but modern history, always interested in policy, workhouses, crime, prisons, those kinds of things. Um, uh, and uh, then I did a PhD around social science, around crime history, gender history. I did a book called Bad Girls in Britain, which was about what happened to generations of girls who were uh, incarcerated for various purposes, you know, in the, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and the fact many of them were trained to become servants, which will be useful later on. Um, so that's PhD. And then I ended up lecturing in history, social history, sociology, criminology, at that time when criminology was taking, uh, beginning to rise, you know, in the, in the uh, sort of 20 years ago. Uh, so that's why I've got this, uh, this sort of disciplinary spread. So in a way, this project is kind of like my dream project in the end. It combines all those things in one. I had to wait to the age of almost 50 to get to my dream project. Um, but funded by the ESRC. The point of it is that we're looking at um, who were victims in the criminal courts and what did they actually do, what actions did they take once they had experienced uh, an, an offence. And we're looking at that from 1670 to the present. So we're, we're using um, digital data. Uh, we're using digitised Old Bailey data uh, to search basically every single victim that passed through that system from 1675 to the 1910s when the digitisation stops and then we up supplement it with other methods um, up, to, up to the present. We're looking at uh, British Crime Survey data and Crime Survey for England and Wales data and we've aggregated those together. And we've got, so we've now got a 30-year span run of, uh, of, of crime, uh, crime survey of England and Wales data, which is proving very interesting, I think, to the Victims Commissioner, who's one of our stakeholders, because you can actually see, well, who is, answering, who is answering the British Crime Survey from the point of view of a victim? What are they actually experiencing? What do they do about it? How many of them are accessing things like victim support? How, does, is there a correlation between their participation and their uh, satisfaction with the justice system? So it's enabling us to answer all sorts of questions. Um, so this is, this is the team, and we meet at Liverpool University. Uh, if any of you know anything about victimology, you'll know the name Sandra Walklate, and Sandra Walklate's uh, in, in, the, in the back there um, with the red scarf. So that's, that's, uh, that's the team there. So it's historians, criminologists, um, uh, socio-legal people, lawyers, and so on. We look a very undiverse group. There are uh, you, uh, North Americans in there and Italians uh, and, and others. But that is another big question here. As I, in fact, it's the subject of a whole other talk about interdisciplinary is one thing, but diverse interdisciplinarity is another thing. And, and certainly that's something we're trying to address at SENS at the moment. So the aims of that project are to uh, profile victims engaging in criminal trials, to track combinations of rights, resources and services available to them and track the use and uptake of them uh, over that time and to use that new data to, to look at justice gaps and, uh, and uh, framing uh, access to justice questions. Um, now, one of the resources available to victims is the police, but of course the police aren't invented until 1820, so if you're looking at a period before the police and a victim doesn't have a police officer to whom to report a crime, the victim becomes the complainant, the victim is the prosecutor. They're called prosecutrixes and prosecutors in court, so they're leading their own uh, case. 
And it's completely, so the victim is absolutely at the centre of the justice system before the police. So it flips our thinking about now, you know, the need to, you know, recover victims' rights and give victims' rights and so on. Victims had their rights eroded for a reason, which was partly to do with a socialised, state-based justice system. Um, so we have very interesting conversations with, uh, with uh, various stakeholders around, around, around this issue. Um, that's, uh, I won't have to talk too much about our data set, but we've got um, victims in Old Bailey trials, uh, we've got Times reports of victims in Old Bailey trials, and then we've got our British crime survey data and survey for England and Wales. So I guess, you know, how does any of that, uh, or what, what, what grounds does that have for, I mean, what contribution can that make to the public good or otherwise? And I think, I mean, I've, I've indicated in some of my comments there that our stakeholders include victim support nationally, CAB Witness Advice Service, the Victims Commissioner's Office, and we, we talk to them quite regularly about um, how uh, this, this long-run data might um, impact what, what, what they're doing. And it's, it's a, I won't make any great claims for it at all, but it's, it's an interesting uh, dialogue that we're, that we're having there. I think the aggregated data sets, which are going to be publicly available and searchable, are going to be um, potentially interesting there. Let me flip to an, uh, the second one. Um, so, uh, criminal justice is one of my sort of areas, family justice is another, and um, I'm involved in this project on recurrent, reducing recurrent care proceedings in the uh, family law system in Britain, and this is another interdisciplinary one, but a totally different direction. This is involving clinical psychologists and health psychologists, um, and me there. So, um, what we're doing there, this is fairly shocking, this project. This is absolutely stunning in many ways. So one in four birth mothers who loses a child to care will go on to have a second child taken into care within seven years. So one in four of those uh, will go on to experience a second rem uh, removal of a child. Now, um, and if you're thinking about uh, public benefit of that research, uh, it, can, it can go in a number of ways. Um, Obviously, trying to avoid repeat care proceedings is, I would say, generally a public good um, to reduce harms to um, families, certainly harms to children, potentially. But it's also there's a cost-saving element that every single avoided set of care proceedings saves the local authority £100,000. So that's the care proceedings alone. And if a child goes on to become looked after... Um, that, that child will, uh, supporting that child will cost £45,000 a year till age 18. So you can see avoiding even a s small numbers of, of care proceedings actually has a huge effect for, for local authorities. Um, and what the research has done, uh, it's, it's, well, you can read it there, you know, it's new service design and development, um, actually developing new services to work with hard to reach birth mothers who, to, to reduce the likelihood of recurrence. New evaluation methodology, very bespoke qualitative methodologies mixed with clinical um, psychometric measures as well, um, and new resources for frontline staff and uh, birth parents. So that's been another very um, interesting one. Um, so what, what I just... Let's just go back to that one. One second. I mentioned um, Adam, Adrian Smith's talk this morning, I'm sure most of you were here, I, I thought it's, fa it's fabulous, um, it's compelling, um, it's also very technocratic, you know, this idea that if we, from the top down we can, you can look at, look, get this data, and you can oversee everything, and it's quite a Foucauldian kind of gaze around, you know, you can you know, narrow in, you can bespoke, you can target and so on, and you can have macro solutions to quite complex social problems. And, and part of that is very compelling, and I, I agree with a lot of it. But what I would say is, where's the space for the micro? Where's the space for the word, very word relationships within that? I mean, a lot of the work we do with, with, uh, with, with birth mothers and practitioners is absolutely relationship-based. So an algorithm might help you target the right family, but then once you get into the family, that, that's a whole different set of methodologies and challenges as well. And uh, that's something I think we need to make space for in this, in this uh, discussion. Now, we're, now I'm going to move to communi communication. Because um, all, all the projects I've mentioned, the, uh, the SENS work, the victims project, this uh, recurrent care work, they all require communication strategies. So let me turn to those now. Now, 
you'll know, and you know that, that any project needs a communication strategy in the, from the outset. It's not something you can tag on at the end. So if I think about the victims project and the recurrent care project, uh, as I've indicated, we've been talking to stakeholders from the start. We've issued attractively designed interim findings reports. We've, um, uh, we'll be making some short films to accompany those reports. The thing, uh, film is very powerful in this, in this uh, place. Um, and uh, you know, we've commissioned animations to you know, make it more lively and, uh, and, and make it more, uh, I guess, memorable. I did note upstairs, the, and the displays upstairs, the washing line with the red knickers pinned to it. You see that? I don't know who did that one upstairs um, as one of the uh, exhibits there. Uh, that's not something I've ever thought about, but I did make a little note of that. <laughs> that might be something to draw your eye. Now, what I want to focus on here, so that's, that's, that's so far so standard, apart from the, the washing line, I think. But what, what, what I'd like to talk about is the difference that working on a TV documentary made um, in, to me, because I was kind of used to doing those things, but this, this was rather different. So, with my social historian hat on, I, I was asked um, to, to work on a documentary in 20, what is it, 2012, quite a long time ago, by the by a BBC and a, and a production company, and they wanted to tell the history of um, servants. I don't, I don't need the video just yet at the back, but I just want to get, to get the slide up. So I don't want to play the video just yet. I'm just going to keep that there for a second. Um, so the, re the reason I found myself doing this is because there was a presenter lined up to present the Servant series and that person became ill and they needed somebody else within about a month to jump in. Now I had been um, in the background on that series as an advisor and a consultant, sort of historical consultant. And the link to that was, as I mentioned earlier, I did that PhD on bad girls in Britain, of the bad girls in Britain who were... Uh, admitted to residential homes in the early 20th century, pretty much 90% were trained to become domestic servants. So my, in, my interest in domestic service was in the fact that it was the, it was, it was the rehab for the criminal justice system for girls. Basically, from 1840 to 1940, you become a servant if you go into the youth justice system or, or, or safeguarding. All those homes, Bernardo's homes, all these places were training girls to be servants. And when service collapses in the 40s, they literally do not know what to do with girls. That's another story. So my interest in servants was what came from that route. Um, that series, which I'll say a bit more about in a second, that series was successful. So I, we, we made another one about shop workers. So the, the, what, these, what these two series had in common, servants and shop girls, was that, and here's where social research connects, is that they were telling the stories, the histories, of two groups, two of Britain's largest groups of workers. So shop workers and, and domestic servants employed millions of people, but they hadn't really had a history, and they hadn't really had a lot of social research uh, done on them. And that's uh, interesting in itself, how those two huge groups of workers were neglected by... Um, historians, social researchers. So, of course, they'd featured in a certain number of studies. It wasn't a total neglect, but when you compare that to the focus on other groups of workers, um, it really was quite, uh, quite stark. So, what do they have in common, servants and shop workers? Um, they're both privately employed. They're, both, they're typically employed by small shopkeepers and small private households. And that means they don't leave a trace. There's no record of them. So I think, again, with the big data uh, stuff, you know, some things don't leave a trace. You know, they don't leave data points uh, as easily as, 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 as other things do. And here we have a gender data gap. This was a huge gender data gap in labor history, social history, and, and, other, and other things. So both these groups are typically privately employed. Um, uh, they're in small shops. They're in small middle-class households. You know, only a minority are working for Selfridges department store. Only a minority are working for Downton Abbey-type country houses. Um, so they rarely leave a record, as I've said. They're also rarely unionized. So they're not generally of interest to labor historians, and there's no union kind of record on them. So they're uh, really uh, invisible. Of course, both of groups are mostly made up of women workers. Um, they change jobs frequently, both within service and between service and shop work across this century from 1850 through to, you know, say, 1940. They typically started working 
straight after school. So 11 in the late 19th century, you go into service at 11, um, uh, and, and you know, in tw 11, 12, 13, 14, mostly these are school leaver jobs, which, uh, and then women stay in and out of them, move in and out of them until they marry when they typically left. But that whole experience of millions of women hadn't really, really um, been, been um, very well documented, particularly with the shop girls stuff, the shop workers. Now, they were nonetheless vital to our economic history. They're vital to the retail revolution of the 19th century and the consumer revolution of, uh, of, uh, of that time. They're also, of course, servants vital for the social reproduction of labour in a, in, a, in a household. Take the servants out, the place collapses. So, but before the TV team could tell their stories, we had a lot of data gaps to fill, a lot of gender data gaps to fill. So we had an ESRC grant, certainly for shop girls, to, to fill the gaps. And then, having filled the gaps, we had to find compelling ways to tell the story that we'd uncovered, and that was, that was clearly the key. Now, as part of my prep for presenting, um, which I hadn't really done ever, I sort of lectured and that was it really, but there's a big difference between those two things. And I didn't have a huge amount of time to prepare because, as I say, I was a, I was a, I was a shoe in for the person who was meant to do it. So I did, uh, the TV company lined up two hours training for me, and it was with an acting coach from RADA. And it was terrifying. And I thought, it, it, I, know, I remember school drama lessons, you know, horrific. You know, be a bag of flour and walk across the gym, that kind of thing. But uh, <laughs> it was a horror. So, you know, so I was expecting, to, and I had about 10 minutes notice that this was going to happen. Oh, we've arranged for you to meet uh, this guy. Chris is absolutely fantastic, actually. But, um, you know, just talk, he wants to work with you for a couple of hours. Um, so I was expecting a kind of technical training about camera angles or how to walk, how to deliver a line while walking down the street. Down the street. Down the street. Down the street. I was expecting it to be quite technical um, and safe, but it wasn't. It was very, very um, emotional because what he demanded that I do was, was talk about what's the emotional message of the series, what's the emotional message of the each scene. Also, why do you have the right to tell this story? Why is anyone going to believe you? What, what's your credibility here? And in the end, he had actually reduced me to tears by, no, not, not through stress, but through remembering the kind of the, I won't do it now, but you know, the legacy of, of service in my own family, where, you know, grandmothers and illegitimacy and secrets and and I hadn't really told anybody that, and he got it out of me. Anyway, anyway this is probably not selling the, the communication <laughs> thing to you here. But it, it felt different, you know, it felt like a different... And I'd done a lot of media training at university, da, 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 you know, lecturing training. It's not the same as somebody really getting into your, your emotional life. Um, so i never forgotten a particular thing that he said, and he said, it's not about what you want the audience to learn, it's about what you want them to feel. And I said, oh, well, you know, I want them to learn about, you know, the, in, you know, the inequalities of domestic servants and, you know, the overlook of... You know, yeah, but what, are you gonna, what do you want them to feel at each point? Now, his tactic there was to say, look, because when you're doing a piece of camera and you're looking at a camera, because you're not looking at a person, and you have to literally be as, as energetic as I'm hopefully being now with you, down this black box. And you have to um, imagine somebody behind that. And that they're, think, they're, they're feeling something. So what do you want them to feel? Do you want them to feel shocked, sad, proud, ashamed, amused? You know, what do you want them to feel at any one moment? So it's a very dramatic experience in the way that actors on the stage will try and elicit an, uh, you know, an emotional exchange with the audience. Um, so, um, and, and TV audiences are a tough crowd. They switch off. <laughs> they switch over. They make a cup of tea. They don't come back. And our, you know, our task as a team was to keep them interested, keep them interested, keep them interested. And we all understood that this was a shared task, hence the interdisciplinary thing. Five minutes is fine. I'll show a couple of clips and then we'll stop. So um, it was completely a shared task. It doesn't rely, absolutely doesn't rely on the presenter. The presenter is literally a kind of walking, talking kind of puppet in the thing. Um, it requires lively writing, excellent factual research. The BBC made us fact check everything. Um, intriguing locations, music, archive footage, but that archive footage expertly edited to fit the exact voiceover clip. It requires artistic camera work, balancing of sound, the grading of colours. Every single second counts in the programme. And many of those seconds are made to work, absolutely sweat, because the viewers, you the viewers, you don't just need to listen to something, you need, you don't realise this, but you, when you're watching, you, you need to 
see something, hear something, learn something, and feel something every minute of every programme. Otherwise, it's dead time. And it's exhausting. It's no wonder they all run ragged in that industry. I mean, it's as much fun as you can have as an academic, but I only did it for you know, short stints at a time. But it taught me so much. And I would just like to play the opening of the servant clip. And let me, and what I want you to do is not listen to what I'm saying, but look at how much is going on and think about all those techniques behind what's going on in this opening sequence of Servants from 2012. And it's in Ickworth in Suffolk, if you know that house. OK. Let's hope it works. <laughs> Did you play the Servant clip? Play up. A century ago, one and a half million of us worked as servants. Astonishingly, that's more than worked in industries or on the land. My great-grandmothers were servants, and coming from this background, I want to find out about the reality of their lives. Country houses like these simply wouldn't have been able to function without a whole army of staff working away above and below stairs. When I come to places like this, my first instinct isn't to go through the grand formal entrance, but to find the servant's door and go in that way. In this series, I want to dispel the nostalgia and fantasies that we have around domestic service and reveal a much more complex world. I'm going to tell a very different sort of history, one of suppressed passions, strict hierarchies, and an obsession with status and class. Digging through the archives, I'll track down the lost lives of real servants, whose voices have largely been forgotten. Who's this? Me. I weren't bad looking, were yeah. I? Yeah, you were. Very good looking. We were underdogs. We weren't on the same level as them. Mm. And we, we had to know our place. I'll visit the homes of the super rich and the anxious middle classes in order to understand how servants actually lived and worked. But above all, I want to ask some difficult questions that have been left unanswered for decades. Amazing, isn't it? Our country was based on an ideal around service for so long. Why was that? Why did that world disappear? And what uncomfortable truths can we uncover by looking at the reality of servants' lives? Thank you. We'll just pause there, let's just stop that, because actually that goes on for an hour, so we better stop. <laughs> that's that's on YouTube illegally if you do want to see it. Um, uh, it's, uh, I've actually never made a box set, but there we go. Um, but, um, I mean, I don't know, seven million people have seen that series, and I still, and there's people still watching it in Canada on YouTube, and it's, it's really interesting. And the most, uh, it's so interesting not knowing exactly what kind of uh, impact it has. Um, so you're asked to feel, aren't you? You're asked to listen to the bell. You're asked to, you know, lift that pail of water, see how heavy it is. You're asked to smell the fresh bread, smell the chamber pot. You're engaged at a sensory level. And that's what, obviously, effective communication is. That's why we watch TV and go to films. And that's why we fall asleep in lectures. Because it's not interesting enough, especially when the lights go down. Um, have I got time to play one more little clip? You, you, well, you're, you're over time. Am I? OK, in that case. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right, okay. 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 That's okay. Watch it rather than ask questions. Oh, okay. So this is this is Shop Girls. This is the this is the opening to Shop Girls. I thought the opening because that's about two minutes, that whole thing, but you've got a sense of where we're going with the series and, and whatnot. The the Shop Girls one very quickly. Um, this is the third episode and it involves the angry brigade trying to bomb the Bieber boutique. But we haven't got any sound. In the spring of 1971, on a busy Saturday afternoon, a successful store owner named Barbara Hulanicki dragged her husband out shopping. They came to a West London antiques market. While they were shopping, the unimaginable happened. A bomb exploded in their hip boutique, Bieber. The explosion ripped apart Bieber's stockroom, injuring a guard. The bombers were called the Angry Brigade, a radical underground group dedicated to destroying the establishment. They had already attacked politicians, judges, and even the Miss World contest. And now they settled on a different target, the shop girl. But why? The answer came in a written statement from the Angry Brigade in which they set out their rationale for the bombing. 
All the sales girls in the flash boutiques are made to dress the same and have the same makeup. In fashion, as in everything else, capitalism can only go backwards. They've nowhere to go, they're dead. Of course, it was grossly unfair to single out the shop girl for such a vicious attack, but it also shows just how prominent she'd become by the early 1970s. And I want to understand how that happened. How did the image of the shop girl transform so dramatically from suburban chain store worker of the interwar years to one with such a high public profile? This is the story of how shop girls grew in status in the second half of the 20th century, with some even becoming the new cool. It's the tale of shop girls turned war heroines. There were, we think, about 60 or 70 families living underneath Oxford Street during the war. Of boutique shop girls who embodied the brand. She took me to the office and they measured me and they said I was an absolutely perfect size and the influence of Britain's most famous grocer's daughter, Margaret Thatcher. For the first 18 years of my life, I lived over the shop which my father owned and ran. Pause there. That book's available if you want to buy it for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Annabelle and I would be delighted. Thank you very much. I think you get the gist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Actually, one of the questions was, where can people get to see these? Oh, okay. You've answered well, it. Yes. Um, if you want to repeat how illegally they can do it, then... Uh, then <laughs> so it should be available, shouldn't it, oh. if the SRC funded it? There are loads of questions here which reflects the breadth of, of the topics that you talked about. Um, there's a theme about research outside of universities, um, that your interdisciplinary team is, is your sense and so on. You're talking about research done from and within universities. Um, an awful lot of people here um, uh, don't work in universities. So how can, um, this is going to be the only question I've got, um, how can respect for other kinds of research done by non-academics be built? And what role do you, through SENS or whatever, um, having that. I mean, we give respect to anyone who gives us uh, money. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> if anyone would like to co fund a PhD, I'm very happy. Um, I mean, we, we, we know that we depend on working relationships with. with we, social scientists struggle to make business relationships, I would say, outside, say, market research, polling, those kinds of things. We've just had an initiative to encourage us, let's say. The ESRC gave us money and said, you must spend this, but only with working with business. So, of course, we did. And it, and it, and it, it was very enlightening. Um, but, um, and, and I've absolutely, so I think the respect thing is, is, start, is understanding both parties' uh, starting point and their aims and objectives. But, you know, of course, you know, the private sector is there to make profit. That's what it exists to do. I've got not got a problem with that, but that is what it's existing to do. So um, uh, I, I respect that, but I also want to, to, to have a healthy distance from it as and when. So how's that? Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Once again.